Thank you, Martin. Good evening, Australia, or shall I say good day? Ladies and gentlemen, fellow panelists, and my dear husband, Anare, who's traveled all the way from Fiji with me holding my hand because I've only spent three nights out of the last six weeks uh, at home. So there you have it. Nisambula Vinaka, and I bring warm Pacific greetings to you all this evening. In the 10 to 15 minutes that I have, I've decided on four key messages that point to my top four challenges facing the Pacific Islands region today. Message number one, we need more women in Pacific parliaments. Message number two, the fragility of Pacific states founded on Western democratic ideals and Western economic models need revisiting. Message number three, recognize the important role of the church and civil society in holding together the social fabric of Pacific communities. Message number four, we need to focus on mitigation and adaptation impacts of climate change in small Pacific Island states. The Pacific is, I imagine to, the, to many Australians, destination paradise. Sand, sun, sea, pristine beauty, smiling faces, warm embracing hospitality. Well, of course, that's what our government, the tourist industry, advertised to attract tourists as a source of income for our lackluster economies. For the seven million plus Pacific Islanders like myself, this is custom land, owned collectively to nurture and protect us, our flora and fauna providing food and sustenance undisturbed. We call it Vanua, a place, it's sacred land, handed down and willed to us by our forefathers to sustain future generations. Every square meter, even if sold and bought as freehold or crown land, it is traditionally owned by a toke or traditional landowners, the philosophy still holds. For investors in industrialized developed countries, including Australia, for that matter, the Pacific clearly is an untapped reservoir of, rural mater of raw materials to resource, to resource consumer-driven and industrial-grown economies. Hereby lays the tension between Pacific traditional values of our untapped, underdeveloped resources, the developers and the developed world, the source of development capital. We're witnessing trade agreements, and Bob, I have to take your word that it's good for us, that require the opening up of our economies, registration of our traditional land to facilitate extraction of our resources in the name of development. But I pose the question, whose development and development for what? In answering this question, there are four related issues I wish to dwell on tonight, which relate to my key messages. Leadership is a shared responsibility. We need more women in Pacific parliaments. For far too long, the dominant Pacific Island male perspective of development has ruled our shores. As our Pacific leaders meet in your country next month, let, it, let me put it to you bluntly, no offense to all the males in the room, it will be another male affair. Our big man Melanesian system of leadership in Melanesia and the male dominated chiefly hierarchy in Polynesia is entrenched in the psychology of male and female voters in our Pacific countries. Even though we profess to have free and fair elections, and if you, even if you change the electoral system over and over, unless there are special and specific measures to increase women's representation in Pacific parliaments, women will continue to be left out of legislature in the Pacific and don't have the opportunity to show we can govern our countries as well. So that free and fair elections can be the real opportunity for women. For those who don't know, the statistics of the Pacific Islands community of the seven million plus of us, 50% are females. So in a sense, we have undemocratic parliaments. They don't fairly represent the full population. Having worked in the de women's development sector and as a gender specialist in the region over the past two decades, I am now thoroughly convinced that until more women represent the voices of women and bring a woman's touch to Pacific parliaments, 
we will continue to witness tribal warfare and power playoffs in Pacific parliaments, a hallmark of traditional male politics in the Pacific. Secondly, the fragility of Pacific states founded on Western democratic ideals and Western economic models need revisiting. It was the former late Prime Minister of, so of the Solomon Islands, Prime Minister Mamaloni, who once said, the notion of state in the Solomon Islands was conceived, but never born. And I think many of our countries can relate to this. When I first read of Professor Hughes, Helen Hughes, my friend, who I hope to see in Canberra soon, when I read her article some years back now referring to failed Pacific states, I thought at that time, no, we in the Pacific have not failed, but rather the concept of a Pacific state modeled on Western democracy has failed. I think this is fast becoming more evident and political instability in the Pacific Island states, as you say, and Bob has referred to that. One must be continually reminded, however, that in the Pacific Islands, we had hundreds of years of our own traditional systems of governance, which are, by the way, still very strong in our island communities today. And although we have had the imposition of a government system of governance, and I do make a difference between governance and government, only in the past 30 years, I see this as partly the tension underlying our Pacific states. Unfortunately, clientele politics has marked the evolution of our type of governments, coupled with what I see as economical, economic models, which seem to have conveniently alienated resource owners from their land, forests and waters, and given control to foreign interests facilitated by trade agreements supported by our own governments. Now, I do agree with Bob's message earlier. We need growth. Without the growth, we won't be able to meet our other needs. But I think it has to be equitable growth, where the benefits of that growth, the benefits of that development is equitably shared to all sectors of the Pacific. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is the gap between rich and poor.